This video is brought to you by Say All Right. This video will walk you through the steps required to make a hinged cushion cover. This uh, cushion cover will be for a chair. We're going to walk you through every one of the steps from cutting the foam, patterning, sewing, making an optional attached pillow, and then even inserting the foam in your cushion cover. Hinged cushions are often found in all kinds of furniture, from outdoor furniture to indoor furniture. If you need to know how to make a hinged cushion cover, be sure to check out this entire video. We'll show you every detailed step. Angela from the Sayerite Loft is going to show us how it's done. In some situations, you may already have the foam if you're replacing a cover. If you do not, we're going to show you how to take measurements from the chair to cut your very own foam that you can purchase from Sayerite. You'll notice here that Angela is following the contour of the chair. In here, where the hinge will be, she stops measuring. And then she measures the seat portion of the chair. Here it's 20 inches. Then she'll measure across to get a width measurement. We'll write those measurements down on paper for our chair. We'll be using a 2-inch antimicrobial polyurethane foam that is available from Sayerite. Now if you already have an old cover and the foam is still in good shape, you can take that foam out and take measurements directly from that foam. If you need to replace your foam or need foam, you can purchase it from Sayerite and we're going to show you how easy it is to cut with an electric kitchen knife. First we'll place marks on the foam where it needs to be cut to size. Then we'll use a straight edge and strike a line where we want to cut. For your information, this is a 2-inch antimicrobial polyurethane foam that's available from Sayerite. Now Brian's going to place weights on top of the foam and then line up that line that he struck down with the edge of the table. We're going to be using the edge of the table to help keep this electric kitchen knife straight. This is nothing more than an electric kitchen knife. It's easy to cut this foam with a standard electric kitchen knife that you use possibly for Thanksgiving. As Brian uses the edge of the table to help guide the knife, he's ensuring that the knife is being held as vertical as possible so that the edge of the foam is nice and straight. And the results? A beautifully cut piece of foam. If you need to cut a lot of foam, you may want to consider a professional foam cutting tool that Sayerite sells, but an electric kitchen knife, as you can tell, works great. Now that the foam has been cut to size, we'll take it to the chair and be sure that we're happy with the sizing of the foam. Next, we'll move on to patterning of the plates, and to do that, we're going to need our foam again. Now that the foam has been cut to the appropriate size for the back cushion and the seat cushion, and we know the thickness of the foam, we now need to consider that there is a hinge between the back and the seat. And we're going to accommodate for that hinge by using half of the foam thickness. In our situation, that's one inch. To calculate the length of the plate, take the length measurements from the back and the seat, that's A and B, then add the thickness of the foam. Next, add one inch for seam allowance. And finally, add half the thickness of the foam for the hinge area. This is the total length of the fabric's top plate. Let's plug in the calculations for our particular cushion. 30 plus 20 plus 2 inches for the foam thickness plus 1 inch for seam allowance and plus 1 inch for the hinge equals 54 inches. Now that we have the length measurement, we need the width measurement. We measured across the foam and it was 22 inches. We need to take that, which we're referring to as C in this illustration, and add the thickness of the foam. Our foam was 2 inches. Then we need to add a 1 inch seam allowance. And that is the width of our plate. This hinged cushion will have a top plate and a bottom plate. We've already determined the top plate. Now we can take those measurements and determine the bottom plate. All we need to do is add the width of the zipper. Since there'll be two zippers, we need to multiply that times two. And that is the length of the bottom plate. The width is the same. After these calculations, we can now cut the top plate and the bottom plate to this size. Though your chair will likely be a different size, the calculations required for your chair are done exactly the same way as what was shown in this video. 
When measuring the thickness of your foam, if it's wrapped in a batting, you want to include that in your measurements for your thickness. Here you can see it's three and a half inches when slightly compressed. And if you only have batting on the top side, you need to take that into consideration. Here it looks like about two and a half inches when it's compressed. With those measurements in hand, we can now go to the fabric and measure on the fabric the appropriate size for the top plate and the bottom plate. And here we're using the Sarite Edge Hot Knife to cut this umbrella furniture fabric or upholstery fabric. When cutting a light upholstery fabric like this, you have to be careful that the fabric does not shift on you. So be sure that you don't pull or stretch it. Now Angela was using a Sharpie marker. That's not a good idea. You really should use a pencil. Here she switched to a pencil to mark this umbrella fabric. After she's confident that the fabric is laying flat and is not wavy, she marks the fabric with the rulers to the appropriate size for her application. Depending on your application, there are hundreds if not thousands of fabrics that can be chosen from the Sarite website uh, for indoor chairs and even outdoor chairs. Again, we're using some umbrella furniture fabric and you can cut this fabric with a hot knife. If you're using a fabric without a synthetic fiber like a cotton, you'll have to use scissors. The top plate and the bottom plate have now been cut out. Now we're ready to install the zippers in the bottom plate. Earlier we used the size of the foam to determine the size of the bottom plate to be cut, plus a few calculations. We're now going to take the size of the foam. In our application, one piece is 30 inches in length and the other is 20 inches in length. And we're going to use those measurements to determine where the zipper should be placed. From the top edge, we'll measure down 30 inches, and from the bottom edge, we'll measure up 20 inches, the exact length of our foam to be used. Angela has already made those measurements on this, the bottom plate, and then she strikes a line across those measurements. She's going to cut the fabric on top of those two lines with the Sarite Edge Hot Knife. The end result, our bottom plate is now three separate sections. We're going to take the seat portion and that middle panel. We're going to place the middle panel on the bottom and the seat on top so the outside surfaces are facing each other. Next, we'll take a YKK continuous length coil number 5 zipper and we're going to sew it onto the seat portion of this assembly first. The zipper's teeth should be facing up and the fabric's outside surface should be facing down. We'll take that to the sewing machine and we'll sew the zipper so that its edge is even with the edge of the fabric panel on top. There's no need to use a roping zipper foot. We want the stitch to be a little bit away from the teeth by approximately an eighth of an inch. This cushion will be used indoors, so we're using a nylon thread. If the cushion were being used outdoors, we would use a polyester V69 thread. And we're also sewing it with a Sarite 111 sewing machine with the MCSER power system. Pull the fabric back, and here's what the zipper application looks like. Angela's going to trim off the extra zipper, just leaving a little bit hang over the side. That's probably not necessary, but it's not a bad idea. Now we'll take that seat portion over to the middle section with the fabrics facing each other and we'll sew the other half of the zipper onto the middle section. Notice now that the teeth are facing down and the middle section's fabric, the good side, is facing up. And she's being careful to line up the edge of the zipper with the edge of the fabric as she sews that assembly down. The stitch is approximately an eighth inch to a quarter inch away from the zipper's teeth. You'll notice that the presser foot is the guide. It's running alongside the zipper teeth. That's keeping the stitch consistent. As with any sewing project, it's a good idea to reverse to lock your stitch in place at the beginning of your stitching and at the end, as shown. We're not quite done. We're going to be doing a top stitch as well. But prior to doing that, let's join that midsection to the back section. If your fabric has a pattern, be sure the patterns are being lined up appropriately. We've placed the middle section and the seat section on top of the back panel and the outside surfaces are facing each other. We'll take that panel that we sewed with the midsection already attached and we'll attach the zipper in the same way we did previously. 
Now that the zipper is sewn on, we'll take that uh, assembly and lay it on top so the outside surfaces are facing each other. And we'll curl back the zipper so that the teeth are down and we'll sew that to the back portion of the panel with the edges lined up. Just as was done earlier when we joined the uh, seat portion with the mid panel. Alright, now that it's all sewn together, here's what it looks like on the outside surfaces. Now we just need to create a top stitch. Angela's going to take this over to the sewing machine and she's going to fold the material while she sews it. She's going to create a fold that is flush with the middle of the zipper teeth. Many of our customers prefer to pin the material with the fold in it and then take it to the sewing machine so that nothing moves. But if you take your time and go slow, as Angela is here, your top stitch will come out great by not using pins. I, on the other hand, would probably use pins. Take note that the stitch is approximately a quarter inch away from the uh, zipper teeth and the uh, left side of the presser foot is running alongside the teeth, though you cannot see them. That keeps the stitch nice and straight. One top stitch is done, now we have three more to go. On the opposite side, we fold the material over so that it is almost flush with the other side's fold or centered between the zipper teeth and do that same procedure yet again. Do that for both zipper applications. Here we are on that second zipper, we're almost done with it. And then when you're done you can trim off the excess zipper. No reason for it to hang over the edge. I know she left extra, but as I talked about earlier, it wasn't necessary. If all your measurements were done correctly, your top plate and bottom plate should be the same size now. Our chair utilizes Velcro to help hold the cushion in place. We're going to go to the frame and measure up to determine where that Velcro is located. So we're using this uh, tape measure and following the contour of the chair from the bottom edge all the way up to where that Velcro is. Looks like about 42 inches. Now that we have that calculation, we need to calculate for the seam allowance and also half the thickness of the foam. If you remember earlier, we added some link to the uh, fabric for those calculations. So be sure to include that if you need to install Velcro. So our Velcro was 42 inches and for our application we have to mark up 43 and a half inches. Now let's determine the length of the Velcro required. Once we have that, we're going to use the Velcro loop here and attach double sided seam stick to it so that we can baste it in place on top of the fabric. This is the back uh, panel or the back plate. She's found the center of the Velcro and she places it directly on top of that mark that she placed on the fabric at the appropriate location. And now she's checking to be sure that the Velcro is straight with the top of the panel. And just sew it in place with the straight stitch along the two long edges, reversing at the beginning and reversing at the end to lock the stitch in place. Here we're sewing the opposite side of the Velcro. Same procedure. Before we can sew the plates together, the top plate and the back plate, we need to install the zipper sliders. To do this, pull the zipper teeth apart, but don't pull them all the way apart. Then position the sliders so that the two sides of the zipper teeth are even across from each other. 
then pull the slider down onto the zipper teeth. Follow that same procedure for the second zipper. The slider should stop towards the middle of the panel. Now we'll take the top plate and lay it over the bottom plate so the outside surfaces are facing each other. It is always a good idea to use basting tape to keep the panels in the appropriate position, so we're using basting tape for canvas down both long edges of this panel. And then we'll peel off the transfer paper, revealing the glue, and baste these panels so that the edges are flush. Follow that same procedure for the opposite long side. It is probably not necessary to base the short ends. However, if you'd like to do that, there's no problem doing it. Once we're happy with the basting, we'll take it over to the sewing machine. We're going to use the Deluxe Magnetic Guide. It acts as a fence, like what is often used on a table saw. Great device. And we're going to sew around the perimeter. We're not going to sew at the head. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. So this stitch is a half inch away from the raw edge of the fabric, and that magnetic guide keeps the stitch nice and straight along the edge. When you get to the zippers, sew through them, but do it slowly so the needle does not deflect. Now watch here as Angela gets to the corner. She will go slow and she'll make a fairly gentle curve, not a 90 degree turn, but a gentle curve into the 90 degree turn. And then she sews the bottom portion of the cover. Here we are coming to the second corner and coming up the long edge. Watch here as she goes over the zipper. She does it slowly and carefully. We've sewn around the perimeter, but we've not sewn at the top. We've left that open because we're going to be installing an optional pillow. If you do not install the optional pillow, you'll need to sew the top closed as well. Here's what that pillow will look like when we're finished. It can lay in front, or it can be flipped back. Let's show you how to build it. On some of the leftover fabric, we'll measure up three inches and strike a line down the length of the fabric. We want this flange to be the width of our foam, plus a little extra for seam allowance. Our width of our foam is 22 inches, so we're going to make two strips that are 23 inches, one inch extra. We'll cut those out with the Cerite Edge Hot Knife. Once those two strips are cut out, we'll use double sided tape and base the two short edges so that we can base those two together so the outside surfaces will be facing each other. I would re recommend remeasuring this at this point. We do not want it to be wider than the uh, foam. Our foam is 22 inches, so 21 or 20 inches is completely acceptable. So you need to make modifications if you find this to be wider than the actual foam. We're going to turn this assembly right side out and we're going to top stitch it together. We'll do that to the other end as well. We're not going to show that. Next, we're going to go back to the cover. Remember, we left the top portion of the cover open. We're going to insert this strip inside the cover so that its bottom edge is flush with the top edge of the cover. Then we're going to take it back to the sewing machine and complete our sewing of the top edge. So we're just starting here on the long edge, coming around the corner, and then we'll sew through that strip to secure it in place as we close the cover up completely. Angela did not use basting tape when she placed this strip inside the cover. You may want to do that. That's why she's being very careful to make sure that the strip is laying directly in the edge so that it is flush with the cover's edges. She'll sew all the way across the top and down to, to the side where she stopped sewing previously. And that secures the flange inside the cover. Let's go ahead and create the pillow as well as the flange. 
Here she's just uh, being sure that the edge of the fabric is uh, straight. So she's using some leftover fabric again. And here she's trying to match up the pattern so that they look good. And now that she's happy with the pattern, she's going to measure out a pillow. To determine the unfinished width of the pillow, we need to go back to our calculations for the width of the plate. In our circumstance, our calculations equal 25 inches. So we need the width of this pillow to be 25 inches times 2 because we're going to fold it in half. The height is not too critical. We're going to go with 13 inches, but that's totally up to preference depending on how large you want the pillow to be. We'll now take this over to the sewing machine and sew around the perimeter, the two short edges and the top edge. We'll leave the bottom edge completely open. Even though there's a fold on one of the two short edges, we're still going to sew a half inch away from the folded edge and the raw edge. And we're using that deluxe magnetic guide as a guide to keep our stitch a half inch away from the edge of the fabric. All right, we'll continue sewing, leaving the bottom open. Now, we'll trim off the dog ears on all four of the corners. Even at the open edge at the bottom, we rounded that off as well by sewing a gradual radius instead of just a straight line all the way down. There is a gradual radius at all four of the corners, and we trim the dog ears off with a serrate edge hot knife. Turn the assembly right side out, and then we're going to use batting as the stuffing for the inside of this pillow. So she's using that fabric uh, pillow cover to trace around the batting and using a sharpie marker to mark on the batting material. Notice the batting does not go all the way to the bottom uh, because that's where it'll be sewn onto the flange we created earlier. You can cut batting easily with scissors. She's going to make two uh, thicknesses of batting because we want the pillow to be uh, a little bit uh, thicker. She's going to use a spray 77 by 3M, Super Spray 77 it's called, to uh, baste the batting together or glue the batting together, though that is not necessary. Uh, if you don't have the glue, don't worry about it. Stuff it inside the pillow cover and then use double-sided tape to baste the bottom edge of the cover. Not shut, but to create a hem. So basting tape's been applied to this side. We're going to turn the pillow over and apply basting tape to the opposite side. And then we're going to create approximately a half inch hem, making it look good. Uh, the basting tape will hold the hem in place while we take the pillow over to the flange we sewed earlier and sew them both together. Once it's done on the one side, flip it around and do the same procedure on the opposite. Now let's set this pillow aside. Let's do not attach it to the flange yet. Let's concentrate now on the hinge, the part that folds in the middle. We'll unzip the zipper and turn the assembly right side out. This cover is still right now one complete cover. However, after we sew the hinge in place, it'll have two separate sections. Thus, the need for the two zippers. We're going to place the foam on top of our uh, cushion cover by approximately a half inch or an inch from the ends because uh, obviously the cover will be tight and the foam will compress slightly. So we're placing the bottom where it should go and the uh, back where it should go. Then Angela is going to take a pencil and mark between the foam uh, very close to the foam, almost an eighth inch away from the foam. She places two marks. There's where she's going to create a stitch to create the hinge. I know that's not much fabric, but it actually turns out fairly well. As you can see here, the marks are approximately a half inch away from each other, which is a pretty good procedure. Typically, we just use a pencil and strike uh, lines uh, along those uh, two marks that we just placed down, but and just doing it a little bit differently. This works. She's using double-sided tape and she's going to use that as the guide uh, to aid her in her stitching. However, I don't really recommend that because double-sided tape, if you leave it on for long periods of time, may be difficult to get off the fabric. I'd rather see you strike a line. It is important to be sure that the uh, seam that uh, holds these two plates together is laying flat. So Angela is using a seam ripper here to make sure that the uh, fabric is 
folding right on top of the seam because we want those two panels to be directly on top of each other prior to sewing. There, I guess after thinking about this, there is a, a reason that she's using the double-sided tape instead of striking a line because if she strikes a line with a pencil, that will be uh, obvious. It'll be seen. Uh, using double-sided tape like this, you can just peel it off after you're done sewing. Though you could use a soapstone pencil as well, as long as the soapstone pencil is visible, depending on the color of the fabric. It's important that you sew at least a half inch away from the stitch line that holds these two plates together. Do not start right on top of it. Go a half inch or a full inch away from the stitch line. And be sure to reverse the beginning and also reverse at the end. Here Angela's is making sure the panels are laying directly on top of each other as she's sewing and she's using that double-sided tape that she has not peeled the transfer paper off of as a guide to keep her stitch straight. As you come to the other end, be sure to stop exactly the same as you did at the beginning, at least a half inch or more away from the stitch that holds the plates together. Now simply repeat that same procedure for the line that's approximately a half inch away from the other. After you're done sewing, be sure to remove the transfer paper and the glue from the fabric now. Don't leave it on there overnight. There we go. Okay, now let's sew the headrest to the flange. This is obviously an optional step. If you didn't choose to have a headrest, skip this chapter. It is extremely important to place at least one row of double-sided tape inside the middle of the flange. We're going to place two rows of a double-sided tape inside this flange because if the flange moves while you're sewing the headrest on, it's a disaster. Trust me. And here towards the very end of that flange, we're placing another row, the second row of double-sided tape to help hold the flange in place. If you don't have double-sided tape, you could use straight pins. I recommend the double-sided tape highly, as always. Now let's measure up from the actual cover by approximately one inch and strike a line. Do this carefully because if your pillow uh, is sewn on crooked, you will notice it uh, when the uh, cover is complete. So be sure to measure carefully and then place double-sided tape on that. And Angela's checking one more time to make sure that the double-sided tape is straight with the actual cover. If you were careful and lined up any patterns, if your uh, cover has patterns, you want to be sure that you're sewing the pillow on appropriately so that it looks best. That's what Angela is checking now. All right, now we'll peel off the transfer paper of the double-sided tape on top of the flange and we'll carefully base the pillow so that it is flush with the edges of the cover. The pillow may be slightly different in size. Hopefully it's not oversized. It's better for it to be undersized than oversized. We made it so that it was exactly the same width as the cover. And she's uh, basting the uh, one side of the pillow to the double-sided tape and then she's checking to make sure the pillow is straight again. Always a good idea. Flip it over and baste the other side just like we did on the opposite side. Once you're happy, take it to the sewing machine and sew approximately an eighth inch from the fold underneath the pillow, securing it to the flange and also closing the pillow up permanently. All the way to the other side. Reverse to lock the stitch in place when you begin and also reverse at the end. Alright, we're done. Let's take a look at the other side. Looks good. Now all we have to do is insert the foam. And there's an easy way to do that. And there's a way to protect the foam from moisture using silk film. We're going to show you about that next. If your cushion is used indoors, it's probably not necessary to use silk film. But if your cushion is used outdoors and you're using an antimicrobial polyurethane foam, we highly recommend using silk film to help protect the foam from the moisture. We've cut the silk film to approximately 24 inches larger than the entire sheet of foam. And this silk film is folded in half. We call that a center fold. So she unfolds it and then wraps it around the entire foam. Another advantage to using silk foam is not just the fact that it protects the foam from moisture, but it also makes it a lot easier to 
insert the foam into the cushion cover. So we're going to show you how that's done. That's the one reason we're using it for this video is mainly just show you how easy it is to insert the foam into a cover that's obviously going to compress the foam. But as discussed earlier, it's also great for a moisture barrier. We're just using a shop vac and we've inserted the end of the hose in between the silk film onto the cushion. And notice how the cushion compresses nicely and the silk film wraps it up. Now the cushion is a lot smaller and much easier to insert into a cushion cover. Now just remove the uh, vacuum and the foam slowly expands and you can position all of the uh, silk film so that it's covering or uh, completely inside the cushion and then just simply zip the zipper shut. That's how easy it is to insert foam with the silk film. It can also be done without it. It's just a little bit tougher. Even after we zipped it here the foam is still expanding. The air is escaping and uh, that fills the uh, cover beautifully. Nice and tight. Before we show you the finished cushion cover, let's go over the materials that were used to build this hinged cushion cover. We used about two yards of a 54 inch fabric to make our cover. Yours may be slightly different. All of those supplies can be purchased from Sayorite. And here's what the finished chair looks like. That Velcro attaches to the uh, hook Velcro that's already attached to the chair. And that's all there is to it. She looks beautiful. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of fabrics to choose from Sailrite, and we highly recommend that you give us a call if you have any questions about which fabric to use or which type of foam to use. Sailrite stands ready to help you with your next project. For more free videos like this, be sure to check out the Sailrite website or subscribe to the Sailrite YouTube channel today. It's your loyal patronage to Sailrite that makes these free videos possible. Thanks for your support.